Rusty, and the Falcon. We're bringing you a very unusual story about a very unusual bird, the Falcon. Nature's own guided missile and the most deadly predator on wings. Yet the Falcon is noble in spirit, intelligent, and as you'll see in our story, capable of deep and lasting loyalty. Now we've asked Jerome Cortman to be our storyteller and to put on a short demonstration as well. You see, Jerry is not only quite an authority on Falcon, but quite an archer. And as falconry and archery go hand in hand, who could better tell the story of Rusty and the Falcon? So let's move over to stage three and turn the whole thing over to Jerry Cortland. Take it away, Jerry. about sticks like these. Even a light target bow like this can be a deadly weapon. So it should always be treated with respect. Okay, fellas, would you get set with the pie tins, please? Mostly, we use the bow and arrow today for target competition. And unlike the old English bow, which is made of yew wood, most of our modern bows are engineered from laminated wood and fiberglass. The striking power and accuracy, they'll outshoot the old long bow five to one. Okay, start talking. where the hoot without good arrows. Modern arrows are made of aluminum tubing. Every arrow in a match set like this weighs exactly the same. And theoretically, you're supposed to shoot the same. That is, hold a nice tight group. Let's just see if we can do it. shooting target arrows. But this, this is a broadhead. It has a wooden shaft of cedar, and except that it's better made in form and design, it's pretty much the same as it was in the Middle Ages. We use the broadhead for hunting and for a special form of competition. Okay, would you set up for the finale, please? Every act has to have a flash finish, so we rigged up a sort of a, sort of a jerry-built gym crack down there. First, we have an ordinary soda cracker, then a candle, and finally, a solid piece of one-inch planking. The idea here is to demonstrate both the penetrating power and the accuracy of the broadhead. back again. You know, it was the knights and barons of the Middle Ages who first brought the bow and arrow from the field of war to the field of sport. And at the same time, they also developed another very efficient hunting weapon. That was the hunting falcon. Like archery, falconry is still practiced today. Training the birds is an art, all in itself. So before we get into our story, let's just take a look at a modern falconer at work. This is Moreland Nelson. 
He was our technical advisor, and he's one of the top falconers in America today. Moreland always keeps several birds in training, and most of them he's raised himself from fledglings. Like most falconers, too, he keeps an assortment of several species. This is a peregrine falcon, a gray jur falcon. This one's very young, by the way. Here's what he'll look like as an adult. The white jur falcon is very rare. Eagles make fine hunters, too, and are often used in falconry. In a falconer's equipment, elaborate hood to shield the bird's eyes, a heavy glove to protect the trainer's arm, bell, these swivels, leather jesses, and the leash. The jesses, swivel, and leash are fastened together, and then each jess is attached to one of the bird's legs. After the birds get used to the jesses, the first short flights are made with a long string replacing the leash. Falcons are trained to fly directly to the gloved hand, where they get their reward of meat. Later, from a patch of leather and some feathers, a lure is made. And the bird learns to fly to that. pick up the lure in mid-air. When the big day finally comes, the day when the falcon will be tossed on his first free flight, his eyes remain covered until the last possible moment. The hood is removed, then a gentle word or two from the falconer. The bird is off for the hunt. Just what a falcon hunts and how it hunts is part of another story. So let's get on with it. It's a story of today. A story of a falcon and the strange part it played in the life of a 12-year-old boy named Rusty. Now I guess we'll all agree that a boy, any boy, is a mighty curious thing. Rusty, for instance, was able to live in two different worlds at the same time. His real-life world was a little mining town in the Rockies, but his other world was make-believe, a secret world that he kept all for his own. A boy's a curious thing, a curious thing is a boy. With his head full of dreams and with time on his hands, he lives in a world only he understands, oh yes, a boy is a curious thing. Wherever a boy walks, he walks with joy, and a number all of his curious ways would take a month of Saturdays. He can talk to the birds, run with the breeze, and on the old rope swing down by the creek, He's the original man on the flying trapeze. Yes, a boy is a wonderful thing. A boy is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing is a boy. So he walks by himself till he's never alone. For all things on earth he will claim as his own. Oh, yes. A boy is a wonderful thing. A boy is a walking question mark, and to satisfy his insatiable curiosity, he pauses now and then to ponder some small mystery of nature. And he can find within one little stone a world of joy. It can be smelled or rubbed or simply thrown. A boy is also a wonder worker, a maker of marvels, a wizard in his own right. Why, if he just puts his mind to it, quick as a wish, he can instantly change a rock or a tree into something quite strange. A boy is a curious 
sing, a curious thing is a boy. With his head in the clouds and a smile on his face, he can't be recalled from his faraway place. So call him as long as you can. Rusty's faraway place, a place where the world of grown-up school and chores was forever shut out, an abandoned mine shaft, the ideal spot for a secret hideout. Now, Rusty was a boy who kept pretty much to himself, but what he lacked in real-life companionship, he tried to make up for with his own imagination. Today, he'd come here to take a trip. He would lead a safari into darkest Africa to hunt big game with a bow and arrow. And as usual, his magic carpet was a book. Rusty lived every word of these adventure stories. To him, this was classic literature in its purest form. The enraged lion charged. His cruel yellow eyes blazed with cold, fearless hate. Calmly, Bravely, the young archer stood his ground. Only one thing between him and violent death, the slender shaft of the arrow. The long bow bends, the string is taut, and then... obvious what had happened. The hawk had been diving at something and had hurt its wing on the guy wire. But what kind of a hawk was it? For one thing, it certainly wasn't afraid. And there was something about its eyes. They seemed to look right through you. Then Rusty knew it was a falcon. He read a book on falconry once. And now wild thoughts went tumbling through his head. He'd catch the bird, nurse it back to health, then he'd train it and they'd go hunting together. protect his arm from the bird's talons. But in this emergency, his shirt would have to do. And the falcon needed jesses. That's the rawhide leash that holds the falcon captive. In this case, a shoestring would serve the purpose. Falconry was a sport of kings. And now, with the falcon on his arm, that's just what Rusty felt like. A king, by golly, a king. Rusty had a habit of bringing a wide assortment of animals home. 
But no matter how many times it happened, it was always a shock to him when his mother refused to let him keep livestock in the house. What have you got there? The salt Well, you get it out of this house right this minute. No, no, no. But, Mama, it's hurt. Can't you see? This house is not a zoo. Oh, what was the use? You couldn't expect women to understand. And so he retired to the backyard to figure out his problem. One thing was certain. His only chance of keeping the bird was to keep the bird out of trouble. But already, trouble was coming in the shape of Angel, his sister's cat. Angel felt it was her solemn duty to keep every single bird out of the yard. like a miracle, but in spite of Angel's formidable record, the falcon didn't have a mark on it. But Angel herself wasn't so lucky. She looked more like she'd tangled with a buzzsaw than with a bird. It was plain there'd be no peace in the house until the bird was gone. So Rusty's father reluctantly stepped in. He was a typical father, and to avoid argument, he always made quick decisions. But there was no stopping Rusty this time. The bird was crippled. It couldn't fly. It would starve if he turned it loose. Now, Rusty's father wasn't a cruel man, so he agreed on a compromise. I can keep it. That's what I said. Just as long as this bird is sick. But the minute that eagle can fly, it goes. You understand? Yes, sir. Maybe you better repeat that back to me. Yes, sir. The minute the dog can fly, I'll let it go. Now, that's a contract, and you keep it. When it rained that night, Rusty won another concession. Rather than have the boy come down with pneumonia, his mother said if he promised to keep the bird locked in his room, he could bring it into the house. That evening, Rusty got out the family encyclopedia to bone up on falconry, but it left many of his questions unanswered. And as usual, so did his father. Next morning, bright and early, Rusty left for the library to find that book he'd read on falconry. There was so much he had to learn. What to feed his bird, how to train it, and so forth. Traditionally, a library is a citadel of silence, but in Rusty's town, it was a tomb. This was due entirely to the rigid rule of Mrs. McMurtry, the librarian. So 
Of course, this greatly disturbed Professor Malakote, the high school principal. And, of course, the only empty seat was right in front of him. Now, the professor had one infallible method for controlling small boys. He was the grand master of the withering look. Trading eyes of his bird were so keen, so sensitive, that they had to be covered occasionally with a hood. This would keep the bird calm and easy to handle. Well, millinery was a little out of Rusty's line, but in time, with a little ingenuity, he converted a brand new moccasin into quite a professional piece of headgear. out to be. it did have a beneficial effect on the collection that day. Falconer. Bird couldn't fly yet, 
or could it? He held the falcon into the wind, and then it happened. In this first glorious moment, Rusty completely forgot his promise to his father. His one concern was with the bird itself. Would it fly away forever, or would it come back? But the bird did come back, and Rusty's heart began to beat again with a wild joy he'd never known before. could not know that nature had prepared a startling climax to this aerial ballet. Up from the meadow, another bird took the air, and like a falling arrow, the falcon dropped. And so it happened, just the way it said in the book. He had cast his hawk upon the wind, and it had brought him a game bird prized by all hunters, a ring-necked pheasant. Rusty was a falconer. And even as he took his just reward, Rusty knew that here was the answer to his problem, the perfect way to win over his father and extend his contract to keep the falcon. on the table. Yes, Rusty knew his father had a weakness for fresh game, and pheasant most of all. The falcon was at once accepted as a respected member of the family. Rusty was happy, and even the women folk were content to call off hostilities. Rusty's father went so far as to toast the success of the new family provider with a drumstick. That was a mistake.
verdict was obvious. It didn't even have to be said. Rusty knew the Falcon had to go. Next morning before work, Rusty and his father went to the old mine trestle outside of town. It wasn't a happy moment. His father knew now what the bird meant to the boy. But he also thought he knew what was best for everybody. Rusty's father solved it in a typical father's way. He just left it up to Rusty. Told him to figure it out for himself, but under no circumstances to come home with that bird. to snatch her child right out of the baby buggy. And then the real trouble started. Rusty saw Joe Morgan's racing pigeon. And Joe saw the hawk. And the hawk spotted the pigeon all at the same time. Joe let out a yell you could hear all over town. He wanted a gun and he wanted it quick. his way out of this. He was in real trouble. But he didn't blame the falcon. It had only done what nature taught it. He had to admit the pigeon was pretty dead all right. And it looked like Joe Morgan was going to make sure the falcon was in the same condition. Rusty 
he knew he had to do something and do it fast. So he took off for the hill. Better let things quiet down for a while. The neighbors formed a grievance committee and paid a visit to Rusty's house. Tom Bennett, the police chief, acted as spokesman. Rusty's father understood how they felt and agreed to pay all damages. But it wasn't only pigeons they were worried about. The very lives of their children were in danger. Of course, the falcon would never attack an infant, and Rusty's father knew it. So he reassured them and promised that he'd take care of the boy and the bird the minute they got home. But right now, home had no part in Rusty's plan. He'd flushed another pheasant. And now the falcon was about to provide him with his dinner. Inside his hideout, Rusty was prepared to hole up for as long as he had to. A week, a year, maybe the rest of his life, he didn't care. He lived here like a happy hermit safe in his own secret world. Food would never be a problem, for the falcon would do the hunting and they'd live off the land like Robinson Crusoe or Huck Finn. thunderstorm can shake even the firmest resolve. But Rusty was determined to try to stick it out, wet or dry. His main concern was for the hawk. He knew that falcons can't abide water, so he set about making a more comfortable perch for his pet. couldn't know the time, the rain, and these old timbers had set a death trap here. night it rained, and all through the night the family waited and worried. Rusty's father blamed himself. If he'd worried less about his own peace and quiet and more about his son, the boy might have come to him with his problems and not gone running off to heaven knows where. nature had numbed Rusty's mind. He couldn't remember how he'd spent the night, but now his senses began to clear, and he realized he was hopelessly trapped, pinned down. He'd never get out. And no one would ever find him here. He'd covered his tracks too well. to be brave, but his mind kept picturing his inevitable fate, slow starvation.
Well, if it had to be, at least he wouldn't let the falcon die too. It took all of his courage, but he had to send the bird away. Go on, Big Hawk. Good luck. No one in the family had slept that night, and Rusty's father had spent the long hours in some objective soul searching. Now he had to admit he knew so little about his own son, he hadn't the slightest idea where to begin to look for him. But Mother had the answer to that. Why not phone the neighbors, organize a search party? She was sure they'd be willing to help. But help was already on the way. returned to Rusty before, it might do it again, if he could just keep it in sight. It was the hawk's cry that brought Joe Morgan out. Determined to finish the job this time. The frantic yell from Rusty's father was lost in the roar of the gun. It was a hit. Of course, Joe couldn't possibly know what he'd done, but Rusty's father told him in pretty strong language until he saw that the bird really wasn't dead after all. Joe had only winked. So the chase began again. known the bird would come back. Now, whatever happened, they would face it together. Get him out of here.
pretty banged up and sore. It didn't feel like any bones were broken, but they'd get him right down to the doctor to make sure. In his own boy's way, Rusty said thanks. Then he reminded his father he was forgetting something, something pretty important now. To be a falconer, the book said, a man must possess two cardinal virtues, patience and understanding. Rusty was beginning to discover his father had a generous share of both. And so that first little lesson in falconry was not to be the last. On weekends now, Joe Morgan's pigeons can fly all over town if they want to. But the hawk is miles away with two expert falconers. Yes, Rusty and his father spend a lot of time together now. Hunting, fishing, all kinds of things. For you see, when the falcon found Rusty, Rusty found his father. And his father found the rarest reward of all. The strange and wonderful world of a boy.